The SOLO-1 trial is uh, the first international randomized phase three study to incorporate a PARP inhibitor, in this case, Olaparib, into the kind of treatment context of frontline ovarian cancer chemotherapy. Um, it uh, enrolled women who were newly diagnosed stage three or four, high-grade serous or high-grade endometrioid ovarian cancer who had a BRCA mutation, either germline or somatic. They had to be of excellent performance status and uh, they had to have an attempt at a cytoreduction. And they also had to have either a complete or partial response to chemotherapy uh, following their frontline chemotherapy, which is common. Then they were randomized in a two to one fashion to receive a lap of uh, 300 milligram tablets twice daily or placebo and were stratified by complete or partial response. Uh, treatment was continued until disease progression or if no disease progression was noted, treatment was stopped at two years. The exception to that was for patients who entered SOLO1 with partial response, if they still had evidence of disease but it was stable at that two year mark and the uh, patient's treating physician felt that they were obtaining clinical benefit, they could uh, extend treatment beyond two years um, with permission from uh, the study. The primary endpoint was investigator assessed progression free survival. And then key secondary endpoints were uh, progression-free survival as assessed by the Blind and Independent Central Review. So that was sort of a sensitivity analysis for the primary endpoint. Progression-free survival to time to first and time to second subsequent therapy, and then um, health-related quality of life. And certainly we'll be looking at overall survival, uh, but those results were, were not presented at this meeting. When we look at the women who came on to study, they represented what we see with uh, frontline BRCA positive ovarian cancer. Uh, they um, were a very good performance status. The majority of them were stage three as opposed to stage four, about 80% were stage three. 75% uh, of them were BRCA1 versus BRCA2. And although we allowed both uh, germline and somatic patients to come on study, uh, if you came on study with a somatic test, it had to be done with a commercially available test for tumor at that time. But in 2000, 13 and 14, there really weren't any of those tests, so only two patients came on to study with a somatic mutation only. There was one each, BRC1 and BRC2. Uh, about 75% of patients had um, uh, an attempt at frontline side reduction, and of those, 75% were side reduced to no gross residual disease. Uh, so this was a very good performance status group of patients, 80% of patients had a complete response when they started SOLO1 therapy. When we look at the primary outcome, the group of women who were randomized to placebo performed exactly as we expected them to do. Uh, so their median progression-free survival was 13.8 months. And you have to remember that that is from the completion of chemotherapy. So most studies measure from diagnosis or from the beginning of chemotherapy. So that may seem low to some people, but that's actually, if you add in four to five months of chemo, it's 18 or 19 months. And that's really what you would expect for this control group. So we felt like they performed exactly as we expected. Among the women that were randomized to Olaparib, however, their median progression-free survival has not yet been reached with over 40 months of follow-up. So the difference between those two curves gives us a hazard ratio of 0.3, which said in other ways would uh, equate to a 70% reduction in the risk of progression. And although we do not have a median progression-free survival based on investigator-assessed PFS, we have done several sensitivity analyses to account for any kind of potential bias. And number one, all of the hazard ratios of those analyses were very consistent. 0.27 to 0.3, but two of those analyses did just give us a median for that Olaparib group that's somewhere between 47 and 49 months. So we can estimate the improvement in progression-free survival for use of Olaparib at about three years over that, which would be expected with no therapy. Uh, so profoundly clinically and statistically significant. Further, at the time of data cutoff, um, progression-free survival two um, uh, was able to be analyzed as well. And this will be the final analysis for PFS2, which demonstrated that we maintained statistical significance for those patients who were randomized to Olaparib with a hazard ratio of 0.5.
And that is even more significant when you consider that over a third of the patients who were initially randomized to the placebo arm basically crossed over and received a PARP inhibitor, and we don't know which one, uh, or ones, but they received a PARP inhibitor as part of their second line therapy. So with that amount of crossover, we still see a maintained uh, superiority of frontline OLAPR abuse with a hazard ratio that's highly statistically significant at 0.5. Um, there were really no new safety signals noted. The toxicity profile was very consistent with what has been demonstrated in prior studies of olaparib, just low-grade, manageable, non-hematologic toxicities, fatigue and GI. Um, the only notable hematologic toxicity is a 21.5% uh, incidence of grade three or higher anemia, which is manageable with transfusions and, and dose modifications and is really no different than what we see when we use olaparib in the second line. So uh, the final uh, endpoint that we could report at this meeting was the um, primary quality of life endpoint, which is the FACTO TOI. Uh, for reference, a clinically meaningful change in the FACTO TOI from baseline is plus or minus 10 points. So we did see over time a three-point decrement in the FACTO TOI score from baseline in those women randomized to Olaparib. But over the 24 months of therapy, the TOI scores were broadly overlapping. And so this is not felt to be, although statistically significant, it's not felt to be clinically meaningful at all. So um, we feel that uh, these data really um, support um, kind of immediate, as soon as it's available, uh, access to Olaparib as um, frontline maintenance therapy for patients with BRCA mutated ovarian cancer. Um, we're hopeful given the positivity of PFS2, that this will translate into more women with long-term disease-free survival and potentially even cures, but that will take years of follow-up uh, to determine. So we're not, we're not gonna be reporting that out for a long time, the overall survival endpoint. Um, but PFS2 is a surrogate for that, and so we're encouraged and hopeful. And really the safety profile is very consistent, um, and so there's not any signal that we should not be uh, incorporating this into frontline therapy. So the original uh, design of the study, um, you know, when we were designing it, we really wanted to push it out a little bit farther, maybe to three years or more. Um, but there was concern because really this, uh, this population of patients has never been studied in a prospective clinical trial, like BRCA positive advanced ovarian cancer. We have registry data. We know they have better prognostic features, but we've never done a trial only of BRCA patients in the front line. And so there was concern that you did have some patients who would be cured with chemotherapy alone who you're unnecessarily exposing to prolonged therapy that they didn't need. And so we, we didn't have anything to counter that. So the two-year mark was picked really because kind of what I said, the, um, you want to cover the expected kind of progression-free survival of your control group and a little beyond that, you know, that's kind of the time period you want to cover. And so that's really where the two years came from. Uh, and really, it's interesting that the morphology of the survival curve does not change at two years. So that's very different than what you see with maintenance studies of bevacizumab, which is also a great drug for ovarian cancer. It shows nowhere near this magnitude of benefit, but it's a very um, effective drug for ovary. But when you stop maintenance bevacizumab, those curves start to come back together almost immediately, which has prompted a whole another generation of studies exploring longer duration of therapy. Those should result out soon. We don't see that here. Um, in fact, you see no change in the curve at two years. So what does that mean? I think it's hard to say. Um, when you look at the control group survival curve, you do see this initial drop off in that first year of people recurring, women recurring. So presumably they had subclinical disease that just sort of grew right back when they stopped therapy. So the hope would be, I mean, certainly the, the Olapra group had the same thing, but we may have, we may have killed that disease with the um, one to two, first one to two years of, of Olapra, and, and now they're just gonna kind of ride out for as long as we can. So we see the flattening of the curve there that seems to be indicative of a durable response uh, to two years of therapy. So I think that gives us a lot of confidence and we need to be very clear about that with patients. Um, this isn't like an, an option to stop at two years. This is how the study was designed for a reason. And there's no 
loss of benefit for those patients who are in complete response. You know, those that still have disease can continue. But those patients in complete response should stop at two years because um, we, we don't see any reason not, not to at this point. There's, we're not seeing a drop off of the curve. Um, and that's, you know, no treatment is safer than treatment every day of the week. So if you keep people disease free and you don't have to treat them, that's a win-win.